Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Paul Webley. I'm the uh, director of SIAS. I'd like to welcome all of you uh, in the audience tonight, particularly those who've travelled a long way to be here, and to Professor Christine Alton's friends, colleagues, and family. Her brother and sister and cousin are here. I don't know where they are in the audience, but I've been told they're here. There they are. Hello. Uh, and I particularly want to welcome, though she's not here in absentia, your mother, who celebrated her 89th birthday recently, who can't be here, but is going to watch it later. So a great welcome to her. We've got guests from many people here tonight. Some of you have come a long way, and we're very grateful to you for coming. Uh, SIAS inaugurals are real occasions. Of course, they're ceremonies. You can see we're dressed up in gowns. That's what makes it a ceremony. It's also a rite passage uh, for the speaker. Christine, of course, has been a professor here for some time and was a press professor elsewhere, but it's still a rite passage. It makes her into a SIAS professor. And it's also a celebration, an intellectual celebration, and it's an enjoyable event uh, for all of us. And to make sure it's an enjoyable event, I just need to do a little piece of housekeeping at the outset. And I'm going to model this for you, so turn off your mobile phones first, which is something I always forget to do. Oh gosh, what have I done here? <laughs> I put it on speaking clock, that's clever, isn't it? Uh, okay. Right, okay, I think that's all right. Um, and do note where the fire exits are. There is no fire alarm planned, so if the fire alarm goes, that tells you there's a real fire, and please leave promptly. Now, I'm very pleased to preside over this uh, inaugural lecture. It's the third of the 2012-13 inaugural lecture series. I'm really looking forward to it, and most of my discussions with Christine because she's the head of department, are about administrative and management issues, in which she displays great acuity and focus. But I don't get to talk to her about academic things, so I'm looking forward to anticipating those qualities in her talk on complexity and diversity, systems of finance, innovation, ecology. Christine will be introduced by Professor Lawrence Harris. Now, many of you here will know Lawrence, because he's a professor of economics here at SOAS. And before he founded the Centre for Finance and Management here at SOAS, he taught at LSE. And we were just establishing earlier, when I was complaining about the teaching of economics that I'd received as an undergraduate at LSE, that he himself had not actually been responsible. Uh, Van in California, Berkeley, Harvard, Birkbeck, uh, the Open University, University of Zimbabwe. He's been a visiting uh, scholar at the University of Cambridge and the International Monetary Fund. And I'm not going to say anything more about you, Lawrence, because everyone here knows. The vote of thanks will be given by Professor Giorgia Giovannetti. She's a professor of economics at the University of Florence and a part-time professor at the European University Institute, where she's acted as scientific director of the European Report on Development in 2009 and 2010. She's directed the research center of the Italian Trade Institute. She's also been an advisor for the Italian Treasury. That sounds like a real challenge and the Ministry of Foreign Trade. She holds a PhD in economics from the University of Cambridge, as well as an MPhil in economics from the University of Cambridge, and a laurea cum laude from uh, La Sapienza University in Rome. And her research interests include macroeconomics, political economy, international trade, and development economics. And we're very grateful to both of you for being here this evening and being part of the event. At the end of the event, and Georgia will remind you of this, at the end you'll be invited upstairs to a reception uh, in the Brunei suite for some wine and other refreshments. So to introduce Professor Alton, I will pass over to Professor Lawrence Harris. Over to you, Lawrence. Um, good evening, director, colleagues, students, and guests. Um, it's a great honor for me to introduce Professor Christine Alton. Um, as Professor of Managerial Economics and Head of our Department of Financial and Management Studies. You know, a brief introduction really cannot possibly do justice to Christine's extensive academic achievements, but I hope to convey their essence while we eagerly await Christine's own explanation in her inaugural lecture of The View from the Cutting Edge. I, I, I first knew Christine through her work. Um, 
1993, um, an article by Christine and her co-author Kirsty Hughes was published in Economica with the title Diversification, Multi-Market Contact and Profitability. A catchy title? Well, perhaps. Um, but in some ways, it was, I felt it was a modest title um, that did not really suggest fireworks. Um, it was, but the article, nevertheless, made me sit up. It caught my attention because it refuted the then widely accepted theory that the creation of corporate conglomerates with diversified products, such as the behemoth that was constructed and, and celebrated um, by that era's city hero, Lord Hanson, um, yields economic benefits to society as well as to the owners. In fact, the research had showed that UK conglomerates' potential gains in production efficiency can be and are counted, in, counted as a result of having more complex relations with markets than the textbook ones. But for me, the article stood out for another reason. Alton and Hughes's research approach itself, the research approach that they used, rigorously carried out with mathematical and statistical elegance. It differed from the then fashionable type of research that was hitting the headlines. In the late 1980s, while Christine at Glasgow University in her first lectureship was doing the research that led to the 1993 article, the headline issues engaging economists in Britain were macroeconomic. Monetarism and its critics still reverberated, and big ticket research wrestled with large aggregate categories, the nation's GDP, inflation, unemployment, the money supply, or the interest rate, and research papers were based on readily available, already published data. I too was working on macroeconomics and money, dealing with those intangible categories and others even less tangible, such as surplus value. Remember? But I noticed that from that young researcher at Glasgow, something very different appeared. <clears throat> Instead of dealing with broad aggregates, Christine's 1993 article looked at the characteristics and behavior of individual UK firms and built up from that basis. Instead of using readily available numbers for the economy as a whole, Christine constructed the raw numbers themselves by digging into every possible source of information, including even trade directories and the rather imperfect companies' accounts of individual companies. To make the data usable, she constructed a weighted index of a key but previously under-regarded variable, that is, firms' multi-market contacts. The index itself rapidly became adopted as a standard measure by subsequent researchers in industrial economics and management. And instead of relating the data sample to well-established theoretical models, Christine and her co-author based their estimates on innovative theoretical modeling of firms' behavior in markets, taking entirely new approaches. They, they developed insights into how the individual agent, the firm, behaves in its complex environment, colluding or competing across many markets. To use a term that has come to prominence now in today's cutting-edge research, she had developed agent-based theory. It's one of the elements of today's complexity theory, long before complexity theory became a recognized approach. That's the beginning, but there's been a lot since then. Some great scholars spend their lives reworking details of their seminal paper or monograph. Christine took a different path. She had the breadth of vision to initiate research on a wide variety of issues, issues with great policy significance. Over the following two decades, that research has generated a library of admired books and articles. <clears throat> like the subject of her inaugural today, finance, innovation, and ecology, Christine's publications since 1993 have engaged with topics <laughs> have engaged with topics that, at first sight, seem unconnected. 
but the integrity of Christine's research, but the integrity of re Christine's research has ensured that in each project's DNA were genes that could be traced back to that 1993 article on, conglom on conglomerates. I shall mention a few of the research subjects for which Christine has been honored. Christine has been honored, has been awarded a stream of prestigious research grants, and has been appointed to public advisory posts. First, corporate governance. Christine has co-authored a string of important publications emanating from her research on corporate governance. She then made another splash by pioneering research on the corporate governance of English football businesses. I say businesses, despite the fact that for some strange reason they are still known as football clubs. Based on that research, Christine and her colleagues developed policies for reforming the governance of that powerful but strange industry and has continually been commissioned to advise official bodies and other authorities on it. Innovation. While the grand theorists of economics pinned their colors to the Austrian idea that innovation results from pure entrepreneurial spirit and is pushed forward by economic crises and competition in waves of creative destruction, Christine and her colleagues took a different approach to innovation. Developing principles rooted in the traditions of systems analysis, they got down to the granular details of how innovation actually proceeds in actual economies. Focusing in particular on how innovation is concentrated in particular regions, they showed the role of well-structured support systems as regional, si as regional systems of innovation. They showed that cooperation in regional networks combined with regionally strong education systems and other regional supports, instead of anarchic, individualistic, competitive destruction, competitive creative destruction, those regional innovation systems are the potentially powerful basis for innovation. The article by Christine and her collaborators in Regional Studies 2011, the article called Regional Innovation Theories, Systems, Theory, Empirics and Policy, defines the field. And is one of that journal's most cited articles, surpassing even the article in that journal by the Nobel laureate Paul Krugman. The next field to which Christine turned was environmental sustainability. Innovation towards a low carbon economy is the greatest challenge of our age. Christine's work on innovation systems led naturally to her recent research on environmental sustainability. Once again, when faced with an intractable real policy problem, Christine has gone outside conventional theoretical frameworks. She's investigated the ways in which outside the economics mainstream, Complexity theory, can enable us to complexity theory can enable us to understand environmental sustainability. Her article, Towards a New, Complexi Towards a New Complexity Economics for Sustainability, that's a title I love, Towards a New Complexity Economics for Sustainability, was published last week in the Cambridge Journal of Economics and will undoubtedly uh, have a definitive role. The next topic to which she turned, the financial sector. By now, by now, you will have noticed that Christine is never one to ignore a challenge. Having tackled one difficult problem after another, Christine and her colleagues have now turned to the monstrous muddle that is today's financial sector. But let me say no more. Instead, let Christine herself tell us how, again taking an unconventional but rigorous approach, her analysis links to the creative research on the other problems that she's always taken. Christine is renowned as a team player and team leader. The evidence in, in black and white is the many names of co-authors on her publications. I'm delighted that many are here tonight. Although I'm embarrassed by not having time to mention all, I would like to acknowledge one of Christine's <coughs> long-standing collaborators, from Oxford, Professor Jonathan Meakey, who has also benignly watched our department grow over the years. 
Christian's team building has been accompanied by an enviably strong university career. From the beginnings as a lecturer at Glasgow University, Christine moved to a senior lectureship at the University of Birmingham Business School, where she was also director of the Centre for Research on Industrial Strategy. And she was then persuaded to join Birkbeck College's Department of Management, where she became professor of management and head of department. Christine joined Science's Department of Financial and Management Studies in 2009 having been honoured with professorships and visiting professorships in the preceding decades at many universities, including Florence, Wisconsin, Notre Dame, and most recently, the University of Bolzano, Italy. By the time Christine had joined, by the time we had managed to persuade Christine to join us, the school's Department of Financial and Management Studies had grown strongly as a postgraduate department since its foundation eight years earlier. But from her first day at SIRS, Christine has had a profound influence beyond her research prominence. She created and successfully led our first undergraduate program, the BSC International Management China, and now as head of department is leading the creation of new foundations for our master's degrees by distance learning, which currently have 4,000 students around the world. All the while continuing to build a strong research-led department. Christine takes her place within the, within the proud history of SOAS. Christine joins SOAS <coughs> five decades after an earlier remarkable economist. Fifty years before 2009, Professor Edith Penrose came to the school to found <coughs> the economics department. And I'm struck by some remarkable similarities. Edith had, like Christine, focused on the detailed study of real-world firms and industries, and like Christine, had seen that the search for truth required her to go outside of the conventional theories and conventional research methods dominating the literature. The magnum opus that resulted from Edith's work, the theory of the growth of the firm, has been so influential that a recent appreciation by Christos Patelis of Cambridge University's Judge Business School described it as canonical and one of the most cited books in economics, business and management. Historically, women have been lamentably underrepresented, if, un underrepresented in the senior ranks of the economics profession. <coughs> Christian's professorship, professorship renews Sires' reputation for turning to outstanding female economists for strong academic leadership, taking the school in new directions. And like Edith Penrose, there can be no doubt that 50 years hence, Sires will be able to say we had a leader whose writings, canonical in fact, created new perspectives. It's my pleasure to invite Professor Christine Alton to introduce those new perspectives now and deliver her inaugural lecture, Complexity, Diversity, Complexity and Diversity, Systems of Finance, Innovation and Ecology. Good evening, Principal, uh, Professor Harris, ladies and gentlemen, and distinguished guests. And thank you, um, Paul and Lawrence, for those very kind and generous words of introduction. I hope I can do justice to them tonight. I'd also like to thank the many colleagues I've been fortunate enough to work with over the years, some of whom are here tonight, especially Fiona Carmichael, a colleague from my first, very first research job at the University of East Anglia, who's travelled here from Birmingham University today, and Terry Moody, who I worked with in my first lecturing job at the University of Glasgow, who's travelled from Scotland, and also to my colleague and friend from my student days at Cambridge, Professor Giorgio Giovanetti, who joins us from, from Italy, 
and who I've known now for over 30 years. And finally, I'd like to thank Katie Nugent and Payal Gaglani Bat for organizing this event so well. Much of what I'm going to say tonight is based on joint research, and I'm grateful to my colleagues, Bjorn Ashim, Tim Foxham, Jonathan Kohler, Mikhail Landabasso, Jonathan Mickey, Helen Lawton Smith, Kevin Morgan, and Lorraine Whitmarsh, all of whom have been great to work with over years, years and who have worked with me on some of the things I'm going to talk about tonight. So in tonight's lecture, I want to consider three questions. Um, how might we make financial systems more stable? What are the sources of innovation and prosperity? And how we might reduce carbon emissions? This last one is extremely important. If we don't address this problem, um, there could be severe consequences for future generations. These questions have been the subject of my recent research. They're actually the topics of my most recent three papers, two of which have just been published and one which is about to be submitted. And they may seem dis disparate, um, and I, but I'll argue that a fourth question um, binds them together. And that question is, can consideration of complex systems theory and diversity help us understand these issues? The first of the three questions I have outlined are ones um, that I've focused on in my research um, because they're real problems um, that affect us now and are likely to do so in the future. In addition to being interesting theoretical questions, um, there's a practical need to find solutions, to find solutions to make financial systems more stable to promote convergence in living standards across regions and to reduce carbon emissions and prevent global warming. To embark on the argument that binds these three questions together, that consideration of complexity and diversity can offer new insights, I will set out by way of background how conventional theory has tended to analyze these problems. Having done that, I will aim to show that thinking about complex systems theory and diversity might enhance our understanding. Finally, I will illustrate the argument by applying systems thinking to finance innovation and environmental sustainability. So that's the plan. Um, let's turn to this first um, task of conventional analysis and the nature of the firm. At the heart of theories of the performance of firms, industrial sectors and economies, are basic questions about the nature of firms, be they banks, manufacturers, oil companies, shops or hotels. The conventional approach is to model firm or business behaviour by assuming a simple behavioural rule, profit maximisation. It is assumed the main objective of firms is to maximise their profit, and if they are owned by outside shareholders, and if we assume perfect information in stock markets, this amounts to maximising shareholder value, of which there is a lot of talk in the, in the financial pages of the press. Thus, it's commonplace in economic and management theory to start by studying individual firms, and then to assume that all firms uh, a representative firm, that all firms behave in the same way as this representative firm. Firms have access to the same technology and supplies of capital and labour, so that we can think of our rep representative firm and aggregate up um, to the whole industry or the whole economy. So we start off modelling the behaviour of a firm, we assume a simple behavioural rule, it's a profit maximiser, it's motivated by financial gain. And then we simply replicate this firm, the rep so-called representative firm. And there's been an interesting paper by Kerman on who or what does a representative firm represent. But we replicate the representative firm and we can aggregate up to the level of the industry. According to this approach, all firms are identical. They behave in the same way. And the behaviour leads to market or macroeconomic outcomes. 
If we further assume, as conventional analysis does often, perfect information, perfect competition, and no barriers to entry or exit into or out of industries, then it's possible to show that profit-maximizing behavior leads to an equilibrium outcome where supply equals demand on all markets. Having done this for one market, we can replicate it for all markets. And that theoretical model that I've just described is a mathematical formalization of Adam Smith's notion of the invisible hand. The formalization took place well over one century after Smith described it in his Wealth of Nations, um, and it led to Nobel Prize winning um, uh, the, the, one of the people working on it, Kenneth Arrow, uh, winning the Nobel Prize in 1972. So it's a very significant body of research um, that I've just described. And it was a formalization of Adam Smith's invisible hand. Interestingly, although the notion of the invisible hand is a popular concept, there is only one reference to it in the two volumes, five books and 1,079 pages, of the Glasgow edition of Adam Smith's Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. But nevertheless, it has captured economists and the popular imagination. And the idea is as follows. Um, it starts off from profit maximization. It's only for the sake of profit that a man employs a capital in support of industry. By directing that industry in such a manner as its produce may be the greatest value, he intends not only his own gain, and he is in this, as in many cases, um, so he tends only his own gain, and he is in this, as in many cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention. By pursuing his own interest, he frequently promotes that of society more effectually than when he really intends to promote it. And just to reiterate the point, um, he goes on to say, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from regard to their own self-interest. Um. <clears throat> In fact, Smith's notion of the invisible hand is a prime example of one of the key features of complex systems. That out of complex interaction between disparate agents, firms in this case, it is possible though by no means inevitable, that simple patterns or order emerge. Another property of complex systems um, <clears throat> is that outcomes at the aggregate or macroeconomic level are often at odds with the individual intentions or behaviours at the microeconomic level. Adam Smith's invisible hand is an ex early example of this key characteristic of complex systems. Smith argued that the behavior of greedy, profit-maximizing firms did not, as one might expect, lead to chaos, but to order. It led them to a situation where there's a tendency for supply to equal, to equal demand on all markets, and where profits are competed away towards natural or normal rate of returns. And this was an optimal solution for consumers and society. Embedded in Smith's invisible hand is another feature, a paradox that everyone acting in their own self-interest leads to the common good. And that sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? And that's probably because it is too good to be true. Smith went on in the much less well-read volume two of the Glasgow edition of the Wealth of Nations to consider the role of the state as a provider of public works and public institutions, such as, as the judiciary, the control of monopolies, the education of children and of youth and of adults, all of the things that are necessary to help markets work effectively. However, volume two, book five, has been largely ignored by the mainstream economics profession, who turned their attention to mathematically formalizing Smith's theory of the invisible hand. That body of research shows that the conditions necessary for Smith's invisible hand to operate are extreme. We need to assume many producers, so many in fact that each is tiny in the face of the market, and is therefore unable to influence, have any influence over price. Firms are price takers, not price makers, and the market dictates to them, not the other way round. We need to further assume that all firms behave in the same way. Moreover, all firms know this, that all the others are profit maximizers too, and so they can predict the behavior of their rivals, knowing it's the same as their own behavior. 
We also assume that they all have access to the same technology, that there is perfect knowledge and perfect foresight. Finally, because we've assumed that firms find themselves and that, that, that firms themselves have no power to change prices, these are dictated by the market, in the mathematical formalizations, we need to assume a fictitious auctioneer who adjusts market prices so that supply equals demand on all markets. Without an auctioneer, or some might say without a central coordinating device or planner, the market will not function um, in theories of general competitive equilibrium. If these assumptions hold, then it's possible to show that an economy with many agents modeled by a representative agent can converge to a competitive equilibrium where supply equals demand on all markets, where there's no unemployment, and where economic and social welfare is maximized. The problem is, of course, that in reality, the assumptions don't hold, and we experience markets not clearing with excess supply or demand, unemployment, and financial crisis. Smith's invisible hand fails, a point that Smith was only too uh, aware of. Smith's theory of the invisible hand um, illustrates an important feature of complex systems, namely that the behavior of the system emerges out of the behavior of the individual components that make up the system. An example of the invisible hand guiding greedy, greedy individuals to an outcome that is the opposite of their intention is an example of a well-behaved system that ends up maximizing social welfare. However, there is no requirement or necessity for a system to be well-behaved. And John Maynard Keynes described, also described a macroeconomic outcome based on rational self-interest in his theory of employment that is paradoxical. But unlike Smith's invisible hand, it does not lead to an outcome that is socially optimal. Rather, it leads to unemployment and welfare loss. He was, of course, writing at the time of the last Great Depression, and he pointed out that in a recession or depression, it makes sense for each individual firm to cut its production and employment. However, when all firms do this simultaneously, there's a fall in output and employment at the macroeconomic level that causes incomes to fall, leading to a further fall in demand that necessitates our individual firm to make a further reduction in its production and output with the process continuing into a downward spiral that is known as the Keynesian multiplier. <coughs> While the initial cut in output and employment was rational from the perspective of an individual firm, when all firms reason in the same way, their actions are self-defeating and the economy tumbles into recession or bumps along the bottom. And I guess we're all too familiar with that situation today. What I've described are some of the features of complex systems. Complex systems theory tries to model this complexity by considering um, individual behavior. Um, that individual behavior has system-wide effects that are sometimes the opposite of what agents or firms or consumers intend and they're counterintuitive. These effects may be positive or, or negative. Secondly, it looks at, it, it abandons the assumption of a representative firm or agent. Agents differ in their objectives and behavior, so it allows for diversity. Thirdly, it looks at interconnections, and these interconnections don't just take between firms and between um, other actors in the economy, such as the government. These interconnections don't just take place through the market. They can also be non-market interconnections. Um, Fourthly, it looks at the emergence of outcomes in a historical sense, and it looks at evolution and change and dynamics. And a particularly important idea, or a couple of important ideas in um, complex systems thinking is something called path dependency, that if we start along a particular path, it means that we're, it narrows off certain options and we're dependent on where we've been in the past in terms of the options that are open to us in the future. It also leads to um, lock-in, where we can get trapped into certain technologies and certain kinds of behavior. And it can also lead to herding behavior, which is very common in financial um, markets. Um, so if we look at some of these aspects, the interconnections and interaction between agents, one way, and the idea of lock-in and path dependency, one way is to consider the QWERTY keyboard. 
um, which was used as an example by Paul David, um, who's written extensively um, on the notion of lock-in. And the QWERTY keyboard was designed, as I'm sure some of you know, to slow down the speed at which people could type. And that was because the first typewriters were mechanical, and if you type too fast, the keys jammed. Um, <clears throat> but we still use this keyboard today, and we're stuck, we're locked into this keyboard, and we're locked in because of a system effect. And the system effect is that once you train people to type on this keyboard, um, it becomes very expensive to retrain them. Um, it's much cheaper to poach workers from other firms that know how to type on this system than to invest in training inside your own firm to show people how to type faster on a new system. So the QWERTY keyboard is a sort of explains two of the ideas really of, of um, complex systems so that we can get locked in to an inefficient technology like this keyboard and there's path dependency. It also <coughs> explains another feature, which is the free rider problem. Um, and the free rider problem is a problem in training. It's much, as I say, it's much cheaper for firms to poach workers from other firms than it is to invest in training themselves. And so we see in this cartoon that the firm doesn't want to invest in training, partly because it fears their workers will leave, and also because it hopes every other firm will invest in training and they can poach workers from other firms. But of course, when all firms think like this together, the solution is, or the outcome is, that there's no investment in training. Um, and that is why um, governments tend to subsidize training in order to get out of this particular um, free rider problem. So those are some of the notions of complexity and complex system. What about diversity? We've seen that the conventional approach to the study of economics and business is to start by modeling the behavior of a representative firm, agent, consumer, and to assume that all firms or consumers behave in the same way, so that we replicate this firm many times in order to aggregate up to the economy as a whole. It may seem surprising to the lay student of economics that such scant attention is paid to the question of how firms differ in their objectives, their behavior, and their capabilities. Management theory has focused um, in particular on differences in firms' capabilities, but still the dominant approach in much economics and management research is to reduce the behaviour of firms and consumers to a constrained maximisation problem, such as profit maximisation or utility maximisation, and to assume that all firms are motivated by the same thing, profit, and behave in the same way. However, if we look at firms and economies, we see that they are vastly different, and that these differences persist between firms and across regions and nations. Most of us are familiar with the shareholder-owned PLC model that can be roughly characterized as a profit-maximizing firm. But there are many other types of business organizations, family businesses, employee-owned businesses, such as the John Lewis Partnership, which owns one of our biggest supermarkets. Mutual organisations, firms owned by their members or customers, for example, the Co Cooperative Bank, the Nationwide Building Society, which is in one of the top five biggest mortgage lenders, charitable organisations, state-owned firms, state-owned institutions and services, um, the police, the judiciary, the civil service, all of these things are necessary um, for a market economy to function. These different corporate forms have different objectives and behavior. The mix of corporate forms in any economy results in different models of market economies, the Scandinavian model with a strong welfare state, the Anglo-Saxon model, though there's significant differences between the US and the UK, and the Chinese model of state capitalism. So history hasn't ended quite yet. In any economy, there are different types of firms and businesses and if we're to make progress on my three questions or problems, we need to understand this and study it rather than assume it away. Recognizing complexity and diversity offers a way of doing this. And since we can use agent-based modeling that allows different firms to behave differently, um, it sheds new light. The disadvantage of this approach is that we will lose determinacy. But in conventional theory, we pay a very high price for determinacy. 
Conventional theory does provide an answer, often in the form of an equilibrium solution for price and output, but it's a bit like the answer provided by the supercomputer Deep Thought in the book The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. You may recall, if you've read the book, that when asked to provide an answer to the taxing question of the meaning of life, the universe, and everything, Deep Thought reflected on this matter for seven and a half million years and came up with the answer of 42. The answer undoubtedly has precision and determinacy, but of course it's almost devoid of any meaning. So with complex systems theory, we would not normally attain convergence to a single equilibrium solution or a single answer. There will be different paths that an economy might follow depending on different agents and their behaviours. These are often modelled using simulations to give a range of outcomes rather than an equilibrium solution. Changing the type of agents or their behaviour leads to different economic outcomes for firms, consumers and societies. So let's have a look in more detail at an application of these ideas <clears throat> to the first of my topics, the financial system. And this is based on joint work with um, Professor Mickey. If we look at financial markets, like the markets for retail deposits or the market for mortgages, they are not controlled by one type of organisation. Broadly speaking, the deposits market in the UK has been characterised by three types of financial institution. Uh, there are others, actually, that are smaller. But these are the three main ones. Banks that are shareholder-owned and maximise profits building societies and mutuals that are owned by their members and their objective in their articles of association is to maximise the welfare of their members or their customers. And then we have the government-owned National Savings and Investment Bank, um, which has a different objective to encourage people to save and to raise funds for the government. That's the historical picture. We could, of course, add that we, the taxpayer, uh, via the government, now own significant stakes in... Lloyd's TSB and the Royal Bank of Scotland, but we will put that issue to one side because while the government owns a controlling interest in two of Britain's largest banks that together account for a third of the market, it has chosen not to exercise control and leaves them to their own devices. However, the objective of mutuals and building societies is different. It's not profit maximisation. Their aim is to maximise the welfare of their members, their customers. In practice, this difference is very significant. Whereas the aim of the shareholder-owned banks is to charge the highest interest rate possible on loans and to offer the lowest rate possible on deposits in order to maximise the return for their shareholders, the objective of the mutuals is to raise deposits and make loans, normally for mortgages um, secured on residential property, while only making a normal rate of return on their services. Um, so they're very service-focused, and their aim is not to maximise profit. And they are going to price more keenly because of that. And finally, um, NSNI, National Savings and Investment, has a, a, still a different objective, which is to uh, encourage saving and fund government. If we model a market like the mortgage market or the savings deposits market, retail deposits market, it would be quite wrong to assume one type of firm and one type of behaviour. We should recognise this business diversity, which raises a question about how to do this. There is quite an old literature um, that has almost disappeared, and it's making something of a comeback, called mixed oligopoly. Um, oligopoly is simply a market with a few sellers, a mixed oligopoly is a mixed market where traditionally there were two types of firm that were considered, a private firm and a public firm, a firm that's publicly owned, that operate in certain industries, and we kind of know those industries, don't we, in, from, from the past. You can see why this literature disappeared. It's because of privatisation. Um, it can be shown that under certain conditions it's possible to attain the best of both worlds in a mixed oligopoly. The dynamism that comes from private enterprise and the concern with social welfare that is often the remit of public enterprise. I would argue that we need to find a way of modelling oligopolistic markets to extend this to take explicit account of different types of privately owned firms insofar 
as they have different stated objectives. And we can therefore expect their behaviour to be different. In short, we need to recognise the diversity in the financial services sector and allow banks and mutuals to follow different behavioural rules, one maximising the profit and the other their members' or customers' welfare. Using this approach and assuming some constraints on the reach of firms over the market, it is possible to show theoretically that the greater the mix of mutuals and banks, i.e. the more diverse the financial sector, the smaller the difference between the rate of interest paid to depositors and the rate charged to borrowers, i.e. the smaller the profit margin of the shareholder-owned banks. The key interest rate we get as savers is the deposit rate, isn't it? And the, the main interest rate we pay as borrowers is the mortgage rate. The difference between these two rates is called the mortgage rate deposit rate spread. And it's closely related to the profit margin that financial institutions make. Shareholder-owned banks aim to maximise this spread or profit. Mutually-owned banks aim to cover their costs, including a normal rate of return to their activities. And this point has been made by Heffernan in 2005. And we can derive two clear hypotheses from modelling financial diversity in this way. The first one is that the banks, uh, if their behaviour is really different, would or should have a higher mortgage rate, deposit rate spread than mutuals. And the second one is that changes in the degree of corporate diversity in financial services will affect the size of the spread charged by banks. So if we can imagine a, uh, an industry where there's no mutuals, the banks will have free reign to maximise their profits. With the mutuals there, they've got to compete with an organisation that is not interested in maximising profits. It's interested in prov providing, uh, maximising the welfare of their members and providing um, a value for money service to their customers. So a fall in diversity will increase the spread for the banks um, it should really have no effect on the behaviour of the, the mutuals. Um, this is because the mutuals act as a form of regulation from within the industry, offering services to their member in exchange for a normal but not excessive rate of return. And so they're going to offer better rates um, for customers and curtail the excesses of the banks. <coughs> so these, what has happened if we look at um, the financial services sector? This um, graph, looking at the figure, it can be seen that at the start of the period in 1995, the margins charged by the banks and the building societies were similar. The margin or the mortgage rate, um, deposit rate spread for the banks is in blue, and that for the building societies is in red. At the start of the period, the share of the building societies was much bigger, around over 50%, and only one building society, Abbey National, had converted to a bank. Between 1995 and 2000, a number of building societies demutualised. Cheltenham, Gloucester, Alliance and Leicester, Bristol and West, Halifax, Northern Rock, Birmingham, Midshires, Woolwich and Bradford and Bingley. None of these exist today as independent organisations, and of course you'll know that <coughs> Northern Rock and Bradford and Bingley um, when they turned into banks, they went on an excessive um, spree of lending and borrowing in financial markets and uh, uh, collapsed. Changes in regulation allowed the building societies to convert to banks and the share of the mutual sector fell to around it's about 20% today. This loss in corporate diversity has been associated with a rise in the mortgage rate discount rate spread for the banks more profitability for the banks, other things being equal. I mean, there's other things going on with the banks. And the data here end in 2007 because that is when the Bank of England ceased to publish separate data for banks and building societies. Nevertheless, the data provide confirmation over this period that the mortgage rate discount rate spread for banks is higher than that of mutually owned building societies. The blue line is above the, the red line. And these two types of business do appear to behave differently. We can also see that there's been a rise in the margin or spread for the banks, but over time. But the spread for the building sites follows a more cyclical pattern, though it clearly ends above its initial level. So they're still below that of the banks. We can superimpose on this graph 
a measure of corporate diversity. The measure we've used is based on a measure devised by Simpson to measure biological diversity published in Nature in 1949. It looks at the concentration of different types of species, in our case, different types of firm, and subtracts us from one in order to attain a diversity index. As can be seen, corporate diversity has been falling in the financial services since the start of our index in 2000. At the same time, the profit margin or spread charged by the banks has been rising as they have attained a bigger share and as the market of the mutual sector has fallen and the banks have faced less competitive pressure. There is a strong negative correlation between the degree of corporate diversity, the purple line, um, and the uh, mortgage rate, deposit rate spread set by the banks. In fact, it's minus 0.9, which is, is very high. Whereas for the building site, is the correlation between their spread and the degree of corporate diversity is very weak, and it's only about minus 0.2. We would expect a weak correlation for the building site, since their interest rates should be set at cost and be unrelated to the nature of competition. Although there's a lot more work to be done, and this is a work in progress, our analysis suggests, both theoretically and empirically, that there's evidence that the banks and building societies behave differently, um, and that corporate diversity, or rather the loss of it, has resulted in less competitive pressure on spreads. However, there is another problem caused by the loss of diversity in financial services, and that is financial instability. The demutualizations prompted or allowed by the 1986 Building Societies Act is one of several changes in regulation that changed the financial landscape. Another significant change was Big Bang in the UK that enabled um, banks um, to engage in investment and retail banking under one roof. And the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act in the US. These paved the way for banks that had previously been specialised in either retail commercial banking on the one hand or in more risky investment banking on the other. Um, to diversify across a range of activities. The distinction between firm diversification and corporate diversity in a market is an important one, especially in banking where there are spillover effects from each individual bank's risk to systemic risk, uh, danger of the system collapsing. Full diversification within a firm spreads risk for that firm. But if all firms move in the same direction, this, what we end up with is replicating <laughs> the same firm over and over. If all firms move in the same direction, this can lead to increased systemic risk. For any individual firm, risk is spread, spread by diversification. Intuitively, this is equivalent to not putting all your eggs in one basket. But by supplying... Um, and by, by supplying a, a range of financial products and services, firms in the financial sector are able to spread their risk. But for the industry as a whole, risk is spread by having different types of firm specialising in different activities. One of the trends that has emerged since Big Bang and the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act is an increase in firm diversification as banks were allowed to engage in wi a wider range of activities. This has led to banks becoming more similar as they each diversify into the same set of activities. And so, as I said, we're back to replicating. We've got one bank. All banks now do everything, and they all look the same. A number of recent studies have highlighted the link between different aspects of diversity and the stability of financial systems. For example, uh, Andy Haldine and, and May's analysis in Nature analyzes the sources of systemic risk in banking systems and identifies diversity across the financial sector as a key factor that promotes stability, systemic stability, and they do that using um, complex systems theory. And uh, this is what they have to say. And I should say, Haldane is responsible for financial stability in the Bank of England. In the run-up to the crisis and in the pursuit of diversification, banks' balance sheets and risk management systems became increasingly hom homogenous. For example, banks became increasingly reliant on wholesale funding on the liabilities side of the balance sheet 
and manage the risks using the same value at risk models. This desire for diversification was individually rational from a risk perspective, but it came at the expense of lower diversity across the system as a whole and more interconnections actually, because they securitized their assets and sold them on. Thereby increasing systemic risks, homogeneity bred fragility. Um, and more recently, this, earlier this year, Goodhart and Wagner um, came to a similar conclusion. The biggest institutions are now operating in the same global markets, undertake the same activities, and are exposed to the same funding risks. This lack of diversity is very costly for society. Similar institutions are likely to encounter similar problems at the same time. This makes systemic, systemic crises, such as the crisis of 2007, 2009 more likely. Uh, and we all know what the effect of that is. Well, the banks seem to have lost sight of their main purpose and we ended up um, bailing them out to, I mean, a phenomenal amount of money. And one of the other things that Haldane has done is not just to estimate how many billions we spent bailing them out, which we know, but to try and estimate the total loss in GDP because financial crises nearly always spread to the real side of the economy, as in the case of the last financial crisis, of which we're still feeling the effects. So that's really what I want to say about financial systems. I want to now look at the question of innovation. Innovation matters because it's widely held to be an important source of prosperity. However, while innovation has this potential and has brought undoubted benefits, we should note that not all innovations are good. The financial sector introduced a new product several years ago. It was called the subprime mortgage. Um, but it has wrecked havoc on our financial system and the crisis has spread, as in the case of most financial crises, to the real side of the economy and we're still feeling the effects. Research on innovation and prosperity can be traced back to the classical economists. However, it's only over the last 20 years or so that innovation studies has emerged as a, as a distinct, albeit interdisciplinary field of research focused on the nature, determinants and effects of innovation. Within this work, it's important to distinguish innovation from invention. Invention is a necessary prerequisite for innovation but it's only when an invention is exploited by business and society that it starts to yield economic benefits in terms of higher productivity, growth, and well-being. Early work on innovation highlighted the distinction using a so-called um, linear model of innovation, which postulated a flow from the research base, of which universities and research institutes are a part, um, the research, we carry out basic research and applied research um, through to applied research and innovation. Um, while often cited in the literature, the linear model is incomplete and it's something of a straw man. Though research um, and invention may be a necessary prerequisite for innovation, innovation is neither an immediate nor an inevitable outcome of research knowledge creation or invention. In fact, the time taken for knowledge discovery or invention to in innovation may be decades. And to appreciate this more fully, an example that I like to use is the discovery of the structure of DNA. Um, as I'm sure I like this, because most people know when it was discovered. It was in the 1950s, in 1953. Um, but it's only now in this century, 60 years later, that we see the emergence of a biotechnology industry that can use um, this research um, and commercialize it. But today that industry is still not self-financing. It's being funded by venture capitalists who are anticipating large profits um, and are financing the industry. But very, very few biotechnology um, companies are profitable. The point I want to emphasize here is that basic research and knowledge creation are very different from innovation. And the reason the linear model is inadequate is because it fails to recognize the institutional context of different actors involved, scientists, business people, government. Knowledge creation is about having the time and space to think the unthinkable, free from short-term commercial pressures, with no other purpose than the advancement of understanding and discovery. 
It was an in intellectual challenge that motivated Crick, Franklin, Watkins and Watson, not profit. In contrast, innovation is about the commercial exploitation of knowledge. It has an immediacy and financial imperative and the motivating force is profit or market share. Knowledge creation <clears throat> and invention is a long-term activity. The commercial exploitation via innovations normally has by comparison a relatively short time horizon. And knowledge creation typically takes place in the science base, in universities and publicly funded research institutes, and is carried out by academics and researchers. Much innovation occurs in industry and is Im implemented by business people. The world of academe differs from the world of business in terms of culture, language, motivation, and time horizons. And some see that as problematic. I would argue that it's a very good thing the complexity of invention and innovation demands a specialisation of tasks. We need researchers to follow their intellectual curiosity to conduct blue, blue sky research. And we need businesses to commercialise the ideas that flow from knowledge to generate wealth, employment and competitive advantage and prosperity. As well as to solve key problems, particularly in the field of, of health. However, the different imperatives and cultures of academe and business mean that knowledge transfer and cooperation between the science based and industry requires an understanding of and acceptance of these differences. Knowledge transfer is not going to happen otherwise. This discussion illustrates the inadequacies of the linear model. The linear model suggests a smooth transition from research to development and innovation. Greater, actually it was a a boom to the universities. The idea was you put money in the universities and it would feed through to, in, in, to innovation. Um, greater expenditure on R&D will miraculously, miraculously emerge at the other end as innovation. In reality, the gap between the science base and industry is typically long and wide. More detailed reflection on the processes involved in innovation illustrates that it often requires cooperation between firms and between firms and universities within a system governed by rules and institutions. This is because knowledge creation and innovation are not just separate processes. They're typically carried out by different people in different organizations with different objectives. Thus, we have a glimpse of the complexity of innovation that is glossed over in the linear model. But this omission is just one of many. The extent of knowledge transfer will depend on many things, including the financial system, the skills and education of the workforce, managerial and organizational capability, the system of corporate governance, the legal system, especially in relation to property rights and intellectual property, the degree of social capital, the extent and depth of university business and business to business interaction and cooperation, and government policy measures designed to promote research, technology transfer, innovation and diffusion. These factors combine in what Christopher Freeman called systems of innovation, um, which he said or is described as the network of institutions in the public and private sector, whose activities and interactions initiate, import, modify, and diffuse new technologies. The National Systems of Innovation approach focuses on the central role that knowledge and innovation play in determining productivity growth. And these processes are analyzed within the context of a social economic system that encompasses interactions between a range of actors, including businesses and universities. A characteristic of innovation systems is path dependency. One of the causes of path dependency is the absorptive capacity of firms, their ability to absorb ideas and knowledge from other actors. This depends on the skills and education of the workforce, especially science and engineering graduates. Firms track record in R&D, investment, managerial and organizational capabilities, and firms' expenditure <coughs> on training. The systems of innovation approach has begun to enhance our understanding of the ways in which advances in knowledge, skills, and technology are translated into improved business and economic performance. However, while national and global factors are important, there's now a growing body of research that points to the importance of regional factors that determine innovation. And uh, these include the degree of individual and organizational learning within regional systems of innovation. Central to this literature is the role played by knowledge. Knowledge is a crucial input into the innovation process, yet is an input that is difficult to, to define because it contains both explicit and tacit elements. Explicit or codified knowledge 
is knowledge that can be encapsulated in formats such as language, text, blueprints, operating manuals, codes, or guidelines, and transferred to users who are able to interpret it and utilize it independently from the context in which it was created. In contrast, tacit knowledge cannot be codified in this way, and it can't be easily transferred. The transfer of codified knowledge is str not strongly dependent on geography, as codified knowledge can, be, can travel, but tacit knowledge, on the other hand, does not travel well. And as a result, we observe a strong geographic concentration of research and development expenditure. Moreover, we find that there's a positive, I mean, you can think of classic examples of Silicon Valley and, and the Cambridge phenomenon. Moreover, we find that there's a positive association between regional prosperity and regional knowledge and innovation performance. And this slide um, <clears throat> shows uh, the large gap in income per capita across regions, um, which in part reflects differences in innovation performance across regions. And the reason I've put this graph up is the different coloured bars show different years, from 2000 to 2009. And there isn't any change in the ranking of the regions. The th you know, London is a lot richer now than any other region, um, so is the South East. The order of the regions, the region, there hasn't been convergence and catch up, which is a prediction from conventional analysis. And part of the explanation of this, London is an exception because of public expenditure on R&D, which is not shown in these figures, and because it's of its service sector base. But part of the explanation for the regional um, differences in prosperity is differences in innovation performance. And that's reflected in one measure here, and in one measure only, there are others that matter. Um, is R&D expenditure as a percentage of gross um, value added. In the UK, R&D expenditure is very heavily concentrated in one sector, pharmaceuticals, which accounts for almost 40% of the total R&D expenditure in the UK. However, this does not explain all of the variation. Other systemic factors are at play. The concept of a system of innovation has been applied at the regional level because Knowledge flows between firms, research organisations, institutions and public agencies are cheaper and easier when firms operate in close proximity. The extent and speed of knowledge transfer, tacit knowledge transfer, between different organisations reflects the ability of local and regional economies to learn and absorb knowledge. And since proximity facilitates the transfer of tacit knowledge, Innovation activity takes on a strong regional dimension that may be reinforced by other economies, agglomeration economies, in the production um, and pools of sk in production and pools of skilled labour and human capital. The ability of regional economies to generate, assimilate, and transform knowledge reflects the learning capability of a region. And the learning region may be seen as representing the territorial and institutional embeddedness of learning organisations and interactive learning. Within this, the innovative capacity of the regional firm is related to the learning potential of the region or ability of the region. The ability of a region or firm to learn is also shaped by its absorptive capacity, which can be defined as the ability of a firm or region to assimilate and utilise knowledge. Absorptive capacity depends on the internal capabilities of a firm and region and the existing state of knowledge in that region. Thus, absorptive capacity results in cumulative causation in learning and innovation. I mean, this lecture is interesting because it's a public lecture. Um, and some people, some of you will have knowledge of economics and some of you won't. Probably what I say will have more resonance with those of you that have some knowledge of economics um, because inevitably there's a language and um, a structure and so on to these arguments that you'll be familiar with that this lecture will key into. And that's really the idea of absorptive capacity. The downside of absorptive capacity is that regions that lag behind in income skills and investment in knowledge and R&D find it harder to absorb knowledge and to innovate. And this results in something which my colleagues, Kevin Morgan and Mikhail Landabas and I, called the regional innovation paradox. 
And the paradox is that the regions that need to invest most in, or innovate most and invest most in innovation in order to catch up and improve their performance um, are the least able to absorb pun, funds for innovation even when they're offered as public subsidy. A similar paradox exists for individual firms, those firms that need to invest most in innovation in order to um, compensate for lack of um, past innovation, lack the necessary skills, particularly human capital and a track record of winning R&D to make the necessary investments in R&D to absorb knowledge from other firms and from universities. The problem of low absorptive capacity explains why financial incentives alone for R&D will not help. Firms and regions um, that should make the most use of them will find it the most difficult to do so because of a lack of capabilities, including organisational and managerial capabilities and low absorptive capacity. And I'll turn now um, to the third case, environmental sustainability. And the interaction between ecological systems and economic systems. The conventional approach to studying things like environmental pollution is to see them as a negative externality, a byproduct of economic activity, not captured in the cost of production or the price of products. So, for example, companies may emit CO2 gases, pollute rivers or overfish, and these activities damage our environment. Because producers do not pay for the damage, and because in some cases it, it is very hard to assess the damage, it may pop up on the other side of the globe and affect countries and populations uh, that are far away, markets are said to fail. However, some economists, William Capp and Richard Nelson, see externalities not as the exception, but as the norm, as the general case that is inherent in any economic system, and they refer to them instead as social costs. Externalities are not a special case, they're the norm and they arise because there is often a conflict between individual incentives and collective outcomes, and one, in other words, one of the hallmarks of a complex system. And I think this quotation from Hardin, who has done a lot of work on the tragedy of the commons, is very insightful because it shows that um, Adam Smith's um, invisible hand uh, can have very negative effects, that same principle. With Adam Smith's work as a model, I had assumed that the sum of separate ego-serving decisions would be the best possible one for the population as a whole. But presently, I discovered that, that I agreed much more with William Foster Loy's conclusions as given in his lectures of 1833, citing what happened to pasture lands left open to many herds of cattle. Lloyd pointed out that with a resource available to all, the greediest herdsmen would gain for a while. But mutual ruin was just around the corner. As demand grew in step with population, while supply remained fixed, a time would come when the herdsmen, acting as Smithian individuals, would be trapped by their own competitive impulses. The unmanaged commons would be ruined by overgrazing. Competitive individualism, individualism would be helpless to prevent the social disaster. Examples of the commons um, include fish stocks, clean waterways, and the atmosphere, um, clean air. Individuals have a private incentive to exploit the commons, but if all of us act in this way, there's a real danger of the depletion of fish, the depletion of rivers, and of atmospheric damage and climate change. Common poor resources, such as fish stocks, clean rivers, and waterways, and the clean and clean air, need to be managed if they are to be protected. Society can and does find ways of regulating the commons um, <clears throat> with differing degrees of success. Market incentives can play a role in this, taxes and subsidies, but if we are to meet agreed targets on carbon emissions, we either need to grow less or to raise carbon productivity significantly. One estimate by Beinhocker suggests that we will need a tenfold increase in carbon productivity by 2050 three times the rate of labour productivity achieved during the Industrial Revolution. Complex system analysis has been used to look at the interaction between socio-economic systems and natural or ecological systems. And this was a topic of an ESRC research seminar that I was part of with my colleagues 
Terry Barker, Tim Fox and Jonathan Kohler, and Jonathan Mickey. As we've seen with the QWERTY keyboard, it's difficult for new technologies to break into the market. And so it is with green technologies for the automotive industry. And one of the papers I wrote with Jonathan Kohler and Jonathan Mickey and Lorraine Whitmarsh was called, Can, I quite like the title of this, Can the Car Makers Save the Planet? And the answer we reached was, well, not by themselves. The reason is that there's lock-in to petrol engine technology that requires collective action in order for us to escape. And the sources of the lock-in are twofold. One is economies of scale in car production. That means you need to have a big market in order to produce at a competitive price. And the other one is network externalities in petrol supply stations. <coughs> there are alternative technologies, such as hybrid vehicles, but in order for these technologies to break through, market demand for these models has to be sufficient to allow them to reach the same economies of scale enjoyed by conventional petrol engines. The regulations imposed by the state of California, a very interesting uh, environmentally friendly state in an environmentally unfriendly country, did make a sufficiently big difference, or big market, for the hybrid technology to break through, which is why we do have hybrid vehicles though they are still more expensive. However, electric vehicles, purely electric vehicles, face a second hurdle that is infrastructure-based. Our system has a well-established network of petrol stations, but not a well-established network of recharging points for electric cars. And this makes it very difficult for electric engines um, to become established in the marketplace. If we're to meet these environmental challenges, um, we need to work on the interface between social science and science and as Cap has noted we need to explore the interaction of several complex systems economic, physical, meteorological, biological in which a plurality of factors interplay through feedback processes an interaction which is much more complex and much less explored and understood than the functioning of the various systems which the conventional social disciplines have ever studied Professor Sir David King, Chief Scientific Advisor to the UK Government from 2000 to 2007, gave the closing address very kindly um, at our ESRC research seminar, Complexity Economics for Sustainability. But he laid down the gauntlet for sol solving environmental problems to the social sciences, arguing that there are scientific solutions and the problem was not the scientists, it was the social scientists and the social economic and political system and that we needed to get our house in order in order to um, prevent environmental damage and promote sustainability. I hope that I provided some insight tonight into how thinking about complexity and diversity may provide a way to help us meet this challenge. But there I must stop. Thank you for coming tonight and thank you for listening so patiently. Uh, let me say that I'm honored to be here to express the vote of thanks for Christine. I will be very short because it's late, but I want to give you a couple of snapshots of, of uh, the life of Christine. The first is just a digression. I think there is a cross-cutting issue in the life of Christine, which is her love for Italy, and this explains why I'm here. <laughs> I don't know whether this was a choice or an imposition, but Christine was the only British PhD student in, Cam in economics in Cambridge, and she was absolutely surrounded by Italians. She started loving pasta and cakes we were cooking. She started understanding the Italian way of speaking, we moved the hands, of expressing. She started coming to Italy, learning Italian. She first went to uh, the European University Institute, as Lauren said, then she went to many trips to Italy for work or for fun, and then she ended up even in Bolzano as a professor. Now, to be honest with you, now she has a rusty Italian, because in Bolzano they speak German, they don't speak Italian. 
Let me go back to the old days in Cambridge in the early 80s. These were when I first met Christine. She just disclosed this information, 30 years of friendship. That's a long time. We were in, in Wilson College, a graduate college on the outskirts of Cambridge. There was not only pasta and ice cream or coffee, but endless discussion on Keynesian versus monetarism, on the probability of unintended negative consequences of what later was called the Washington Consensus, on the importance of understanding the structure of the economy, on the importance to find the appropriate policies. We were a big group with a variable geometry, sometimes two of us, sometimes 15. Out of them, about 10, 12 were always Italians. It was a very multidisciplinary crowd. Some participants to our discussion were in different fields, but we were sharing everything, and especially the enthusiasm for debating. I never found in my life such a lively group, and I believe that Christine's work and today's lecture especially are deeply rooted in those discussions. Um, the second snapshot takes us around UK, and I think Lawrence gave a very good picture of Christine. She was in University of East Anglia, then up north to, in Glasgow, then in Birmingham, then in London, Burbank College. And as Lawrence said, she became a really football star, uh, not really playing, but discussing <laughs> about football. She studied the governance, the regulation of football, and she started being invited to speak in all the major conferences on sport, on regulatory issues, and rather than seeing her and discussing with her, I would see her in TV at that time. But now, this is the most important one. She arrived at SOAS. And as I said to her before, it's the only place which convinced her to leave Italy. I think this is a very important for SOAS. And it's here, recently, that her work has had a really big push. Maybe the environment was the right one. Maybe she started again the discussion of our first exciting years. You just heard, and I would reiterate what she's speaking, what she's working on. She wrote a great paper, a path-breaking paper, as we heard from Lawrence, on regional innovation paradox. This was published in 2011 and is highly cited. Just for fun, I look at this H citation index, which is so trendy now amongst economists. Well, it almost doubled the one of Christine after this paper. Now, Christine points out the existence of a regional innovation paradox. Lagging regions that need to innovate, she said, are actually the ones that find it uh, more hard, harder than leading regions to absorb funds for innovation. And this happens even when the funds are offered as public subsidy. And this is due to path dependence and lack of regional capabilities. The regional innovation paradox shows us that there is cumulative causation a la caldo that non-economists will not understand, and the economists will understand that we are fairly old if we speak about caldo. Christine proposed to use a system approach, and she convinced us that behind, we, have, we should go beyond the obsolete linear model, which is too simple to allow to account for the complexity of the world. The paper on regional innovation offers many insights in terms of showing regions the importance of building regional competitive advantage, starting from existing capability and extending these capabilities. If, as I think Christine does, we aim at bridging the gap between academic work and policy implementation, certainly her paper is key and has relevant and especially doable policy implication. This is not all. You have heard that just in the last year or so, Christina started working with co-authors using insight from complex uh, system theory. She emphasized the distinction between simple and complex systems that arise when individual action produce outcome in the aggregate which are unintended. An obvious example that she gave without really mentioning it is the Keynesian contradiction between the micro and macro behavior when firms, she mentioned this, firms cut up output in a recession thereby deepening the recession itself. She also discussed the mixed oligopoly model with different type of firms, arguing that the standard approach between public and private needs to be extended to consider more nuanced set of private organization. And this is the diversity that she has been mentioning all day today. Her analysis, however, opened up to a new regulatory toolbox for policymaker, regulation from within. Encouraging diversity promotes competition, she said, but can also promote financial stability. So basically, it uh, kills two birds with one stone, competition and financial stability. 
Now, Christine also applied complexity to understand environmental problems, highlighting the importance of the interaction between the economic system and the ecological system. She points to the fact that, for instance, not all firms will respond to the, in the same way to a tax on carbon. Some of them will innovate, some of them will cut production. And I think the example she gave about the California, besides the fact that Christine has an hybrid car herself, is fairly interesting about that. She highlighted the complexity economics illuminates why, we, illuminates why we get locked in into inefficient technology with a QWERTY, with a carbon tax, and so on and so forth. And this is the first step to understanding how to make the transition to the new, more efficient, and more environmental friendly technology, what we should follow, what's next. Now, let me conclude just by saying that we are at SOAS, and I think what Christine has, stu has studied so far with complexity should be also applied to developing countries. I suggest a topic for a paper, for the next paper, maybe even a joint paper with, since I'm studying development. Do poor country have to go through the same technology path we followed, or could they go straight to greener and cheaper technology? I think this will be good to, do, to work on that. And what I say now is just thanks to Christine, and let's have a toast with her upstairs where we go for a drink. <laughs>